Another episode of Words of Grace starts now, featuring a new grace-filled message each week as Acts 433 Church brings the gospel to you through the teaching ministry of Dr. Matthew Webster. We have progressed nicely in the What Did Jesus Mean series. Today, in part four, we only have one more week left, and I realize that there still may be some questions that you have based upon what Jesus said. So we're not going to cover it all in this series. If you do have some additional questions, feel free to send me a private message on Facebook, or you could send me a quick email, and I'd be happy to go over any questions that you have of what Jesus had to say. Now today's text has the potential to worry believers about their own salvation because they might not understand who Jesus is speaking to. And they might think that the words that Jesus spoke are meant for us, but it's not. So I know not only is it important for us to clarify his words for believers, but it's also important to clarify it for those who have yet to believe in Jesus Christ, that today may it be the day that that changes. So let's look at Matthew chapter 8, verses 21 through 22. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Multiple questions arise here. To begin with, how would the dead bury the dead? What did Jesus mean? Now, secondly, if you have someone who's grieving the loss of their father, and is looking to leave to make necessary arrangements, is Jesus telling this man that he should skip out on his father's funeral? Aren't you glad to have joined us today? Because Jesus said some things that had people scratching their heads. Okay, let's start to clarify things by looking at who is Jesus actually talking to in these verses. Another disciple said to him, when it says, Another disciple, the word for another, heteros, means another or other. So this tells us right away that this wasn't one of the 12 disciples that Jesus is talking to. This was someone who had been around Jesus and had been listening to his teachings and preachings. The word disciple gives us another clue here because disciple could simply mean a learner or pupil. So this person is listening to Jesus teach, but is not a follower of Jesus. Well, how do I know that, right? That's a good question. How do I know that he's not talking to somebody who already believes in him and follows him? Well, what did Jesus tell them? He says to this man, follow me in verse 22. So you wouldn't tell someone who is already your follower to then follow you if they already are. So right off the bat, we identify this as someone who is curious about Jesus. They've been around him. They've been listening to his teachings as a disciple would because he wanted to learn something from Jesus, but he is yet to make that decision to follow him. So this is pretty clear if you follow the flow of the text. So the problem with this is life always has something that comes up. I think we can all testify to that. You're like, oh, good. My calendar is open. And then boom, this happens and that happens. And before you know it, something else has come up. So in this case, something pro we don't know, but probably unexpected, the death of his father. Maybe he had been ill for a while. We don't know. But in this case, what's happened in this man's life that is super important is his father has died. And there is a potential for this man to leave Jesus without actually receiving his salvation. In some ways, we might look at the request of this man and think, what this man is asking for is something that we would all ask for, to leave to attend a funeral, especially when the funeral is a death of our parents. 
Kaufman's commentary of the Bible gives us even more insight into what is really going on here. The proposition set forth by the disciple mentioned here was not that his father was dead and that he desired to be excused to hold the funeral. He was one of the group known as a wait a little Pharisee who always proposed something else to do first. Let me go back to my family for a little while. Let me go back to my religious community and let me remind you his religious community would have been opposed to Jesus. I will take care of my affairs and then I will follow you. Jesus knew that if this disciple returned home to his old religious way of life, that he would never choose to follow Jesus. When you understand this, you see Jesus' words in a different light. Jesus is full of the utmost love and consideration for that unknown disciple's internal well-being. For we are not promised tomorrow. That reminds me of a scene from Rocky Three. A lot of people have never seen Rocky Three before, and what I love about it, spoiler alert coming, is that Rocky loses his title at the beginning of the movie to someone who's fresh out of prison, who is way more hungry than him. Apollo decides to train Rocky to give him back the eye of the tiger, fierceness to his boxing. But during the training, Rocky's heart isn't in it. He says, tomorrow, we'll train tomorrow. I see, I see in this man, in Matthew 8, the same mindset. Tomorrow, let me put on hold the greatest life-changing, life-giving opportunity to decide to follow Jesus. Tomorrow might be a better time for me. And Apollo says to Rocky, there is no tomorrow. Almost as if Apollo Creed is preaching from Proverbs 27, 1 that says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Or another passage of scripture, James chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Dr. Lotus Delta Kaufman, president of the University of Minnesota until 1938, wrote many years ago in a syndicated column, these words of Jesus, far from being unkind, were prompted by unbounded love and grounded in his infinite knowledge of what is best for man. The best thing for this man was to follow Jesus. And in doing so, had this disciple actually made the decision to follow Jesus, his family might not have allowed him to come to the funeral. Perhaps that is why he was holding off on following Jesus in Matthew 8, 21. Let the dead bury the dead. How can the dead bury the dead? Now, the Jews used the word dead often to express indifference toward a thing or to express something that has no influence over us. We have examples of this in other places in Scripture. Uh, to be dead to the law, Romans 7, 4. To be dead to sin, Romans 6, 11. It means that the law and sin have no influence or control over us. People of the world are dead to Christ. They do not see his beauty, nor do they hear his voice or desire to follow him. Only a sheep will do these things. John 10, 27. The people of the world are those from whom the Savior describes here in this passage as spiritually dead. And so he's saying, let the spiritually dead be the ones who bury the physically dead. 
Let people, he says, who are not interested in my work and who are dead in sin, Ephesians 2, 1, take care of the dead. The story of Jesus saying, let the dead bury the dead, is also told in Luke chapter 9. I'm going to cover it a little bit. I would encourage you to uh, study it out further this week. I want to go ahead and take a look at it from Luke's perspective to gain more insight on this interaction Jesus had with people who were listening to his teachings, disciples, but who had yet to follow him. And as we put up these verses from Luke 9, it's important to understand that this is Jesus' response to people who had not yet decided to follow him. And so, like I said, for many people in our online viewing audience, uh, that is not the case about us. We have decided to follow him. So these words are not meant for us. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Luke adds this third interaction that Jesus has starting in verse 61, whereas Matthew includes just the first two. Now, what I gain from this is that there was a significant amount of people who were around Jesus, who were curious about him and his teaching, but who were not willing to follow him. The first man started it off by bragging about his ability to follow Jesus wherever Jesus went, not understanding that following Jesus leads all who follow him to the cross. That means that your old life is over. And I love what Galatians 2.20 says, that I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. When we go back to verse 51, before these three responses are given, we will feel the tension in the air. In verse 51, it says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. We know, that, we know what Jerusalem meant for Jesus. He said in Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 33, that, See, we are, going, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. And then in Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 42, when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. So, there the, so there's this ominous ring in Luke 9, 51, that we need to hear when Jesus says, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Then to make clear the implications of going to Jerusalem, Luke tells us what happens next and why. Verse 52, speaking of Jesus, he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because he was going to Jerusalem. This is a signal to us. 
if you join Jesus on the way to Jerusalem, you may not have a place to stay. You won't be popular. You will probably be rejected. Now, what was Jesus doing in responding the way he did to those three individuals who have been around him, but have not yet followed him? They said, I'll follow you. And Jesus said, number one, you'll have no place to lay your head. Number two, let the dead bury the dead. And number three, put your hand on the plow and don't look back. He's not saying that it's wrong to be at your parents' funeral. I want to be clear because a lot of people take those words out of context and they just run with it. As Jesus interacts with different people, he's not creating laws for disciples to keep. Thou shalt go without a bed. Thou shalt go without a funeral for your dad. No, Jesus knows perfectly what is competing in their heart with affection for him. Follow me. It's, it's the goal. Being with Jesus is the goal. To do this, they would not be able to continue to live under the temple system as a way of righteousness. So when you follow him, he is yours forever. Union life with him. He'll never ever leave you. But these individuals were around him but they had not followed him and received him as their Messiah, the one to whom they belong. So verse 58 deals with the attachment to your home. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Will you follow him? What about your home? Remember, I'm going back to those he was speaking to and what would happen to them if they decided to follow Jesus. Jesus says, follow me. Am I more precious, more satisfying than your home? Because if you as a Jew living at this time make the decision to become a follower of me, there is a high probability the comfort of your home will be taken from you. You won't have a home to go back to. You will be disowned from your family for your belief in me, for your decision to follow me. So Jesus raises the question about the attachment to our family in verse 60. Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. So who is first? Is it Christ or is it family? Because your family in this instance will try to prevent you from following me. Verse 62, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Those are the people who flirt with being around the very grace of God, Jesus Christ, and then decide that they can be justified by the law. I will follow you wherever you go, Jesus. Look at how well I am following you while I'm on this easy path. You see, this is an individual who hears the gospel message, who has grace right in front of them, but instead decides that they are going to try to earn their salvation based upon their good works. Um, but that he would, in this case, that this man would still try to use the temple system as a way of righteousness. He would have decided to never follow Jesus having his old religious institution and peer pressure prevent salvation in his life. He's bragging about his own ability to do something instead of receiving what is freely given to us in Christ. And so you can't plow a straight line while looking back. You can't do it. It's impossible. Looking back means longing back. Longing back for those three means they will never come to the place of saving faith in Jesus and following him. Jesus is not speaking to believers, but those who have not yet decided to follow him. He's saying, I'm an all or nothing proposition. 
Just as you can't be single and married at the same time, you can't follow and not follow Jesus either. As we come to the end of today's sermon, I want to leave you with a clear understanding of Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 8, verses 21 through 22, and Luke chapter 9, verses 59 through 62. So these passages can be puzzling and even concerning for believers as they may wonder if Jesus is speaking directly to them. However, it's important to recognize the context to the audience that Jesus is addressing. In both instances, Jesus is responding to individuals who have been around him, listening to his teachings, but yet they have not made the decision to truly follow him. They're curious about him, but they've not committed their lives to him. Jesus' invitation to follow me is a call to surrender our lives to his and receive his abundant life. We get to become his disciple, not a casual observer or learner, but we get his life. We get him. And so when Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead, He's using a metaphor to convey the spiritual condition of those who are dead in sin. Jesus is emphasizing the urgency and the priority to follow him because we're not promised tomorrow. Today is the day to make the decision to believe in Jesus. So I encourage you, if you have any lingering questions about Jesus' teachings, or if you're still contemplating the decision to follow him, Would you reach out to me? Let us journey together in understanding his words better, growing in our faith. May his love and truth guide you on this path of righteousness because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and close out our time together in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. And I know that our first glance at what Jesus said uh, might even catch us off guard when there's a request, a simple request, to leave Jesus temporarily to go and bury their deceased father. But Lord, I thank you that we can see his words through the compassion and the grace that is found there. Jesus knew the state of this man's heart. He was more than likely putting off following Jesus until after the funeral because he knew that if he decided to follow Jesus, he probably would not be allowed to attend the funeral. Lord, you knew that this man is not promised tomorrow. In fact, if he went back to his old way of life before making the decision to follow Jesus, that he probably never would. And so there is such compassion and grace on Jesus' response to this man. And Lord, may we um, see how important it is the mission that we are given as believers in Jesus Christ to take the gospel message to people throughout the world because we're not promised tomorrow. For those who have found this message or this message has been shared with them, May they see the beauty of Jesus in the words that were spoken today. And may they, if they have not yet decided to follow Jesus, may today be the day that they do that. And I would love to uh, start the the conversation and explore uh, what Jesus said even further with them. So I pray for the boldness for them to reach out and uh, and for a conversation to begin and so that they could uh, understand what what Jesus did for them and God's love for them and how none of us were qualified for it. Uh, May this message just bless those who hear it. We give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.